Thanks very much, Andrew, and uh, thanks to everyone for coming. And uh, thanks to the group and the centre and uh, your hospitality for having me again. It's been really, really a good week. I think we've uh, discussed some interesting, interesting things and, and kind of joint interests. So, um, so that's good. We'll continue. Um, so uh, the title, as we were just saying, is probably similar to things that that uh, your interests cover. But but I want to just to cover my, oops, my own uh, sort of perspective on this, um, I, I kind of come in from, from physics, so I want to give uh, the representations that I'll talk about are probably not your kind of representations, but, but uh, where uh, this kind of thing comes from, from the point of view of um, applications. So, um, and of course along the way it, it does talk about some of the, some of the familiar um, objects. Um, so I want to motivate it uh, just with a couple of examples to, to kind of give you give you a picture of applications in some sense, and then the represent uh, as you can see the representation theory comes with we deal with very often all the time actually with group representations, and I think last year I gave a talk on some group character methods, so this is sort of related uh, material going in a slightly different direction, and uh, well it, it overlaps with with things that people are interested in here. So um, the, the actual main, um, after this background on sort of Sherwell's duality, uh, one of the particular things we've been interested in is, is a particular uh, diagram algebra in, in the sense that people will, will know it from here. So I want to explain a bit about that. And that's really mainly work with Nick Ham um, and Des Fitzgerald. I'm a kind of a, a, a nurse nurse keeper sort of supervisor of Nick and try to get involved in the project but it's really the, the hard questions are really stuff that they did I, I kind of give I guess the context and, and, and help with some of it um, and then uh, just because of physics and linear spaces and so on I, we tend to see everything in terms of linear spaces I give a slightly different interpretation of diagrams from from that point of view just to as I say give a different a different Sort of aspect of the background, and the last bit is just sort of really cool stuff with just more motivation, which could be a whole bunch of, 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 of things from from my point of view. So that's just a couple of remarks, really. So where does this all come from? As I say, we are looking at, at matrices, uh, matrix groups, and GLN is the good old grandfather of of all uh, groups, and uh, Herman Weil kind of said that GLM was the all-embracing majesty. So to some extent, it plays the role for groups, Lie groups or whatever, as the same as uh, the symmetric group or, or group theory or, or some other kind of transformation semi-group or whatever it might be in the case of semi-groups. So we're interested in subgroups. And, and uh, I think the right way of characterizing what we're looking at is these lin so-called linear algebraic groups. They're subgroups which satisfy where the matrix element satisfies some some extra relations, polynomial relations amongst the matrix matrix elements. So for example the special linear group n by n matrices would be have determinant unit. So that's a that's a polynomial. Um, and these are all complex so we put the n in the line rather than down the bottom because the field is just complex numbers. Um, yeah, so we're all always talking about linear representations. Well, that's just GLN again because it's a homomorphism from the group into uh, some other GLN. So it's really GLN all the time. Um, and for these classical groups, the nice cases which coincide with nice Lie groups, we know everything from classical theory. But it's easy to kind of concoct situations just from motivation where you go from some nice safe kind of situation to something which looks like a slight change and everything goes pear-shaped. Very little is known. So I just want to give you five minutes motivation from my point of view of why we might be interested in this in this stuff. And uh, relativity. This is exciting if you're a physicist. Maybe it's a yawn for a mathematician, but a matrix example. So some, some real matrices. So look at uh, two by two matrices, which satisfy this constraint that x is a matrix, not the space, 
constraint that they're transpose and permission and, and complex conjugate uh, return the same same thing. So I can parameterize them by real parameters. And uh, just to give you the sense that it's physics, these matrices which I've implicitly chosen here as the basis for this x0, so named, and x1, x2, x3 are the so-called famous Pauli matrices from physics. And these matrices are subject to a group action. We're always looking at transformation properties. And just two by two uh, unit determinant matrices. And if you stare at that, you'll convince yourself that, that, that that's, that set is stable under that action because a complex conjugate transpose just give back, give back the same condition again. But by the same token, the determinant of this two by two matrix, matrix obviously is unchanged by this transformation. It's a bona fide group operation and, and it preserves this. Well, that's terrific because we recognize that combination as an, a, a metric, a bilinear form, which is preserved under these transformations. And that's nothing but the recognize that as the bilinear form, which is ubiquitous in, in special relativity, uh, with x0 is chosen chosen to be zero rather than four because people got confused historically with slipping in a, a factor of square root minus one and think of it as Euclidean metric. For some historical reasons, it's always thought x zero rather than x four for, for the time axis. Anyway, that's the good case because, well, and it has lots of interesting connections if you're, phys if you're a physicist, you get excited about that because there's a relationship between these two by two matrices and the Lorentz group and it tells you that there are spin uh, two-dimensional representations, and that's got to do with spin and a whole lot of stuff. Okay, that was supposed to be convincing and exciting and, <laughs> and nice. Where you get to a group, which is an interesting subgroup of, of, of uh, there's interrelations there. Okay, now let's do the same thing in three by three. Are we going to invent string theory or something? Are we going to go from three plus one dimensions to eight plus one dimensions? Well, pity it's eight plus one and not nine plus one, because then we could be in 10 dimensions, but it's not really the motivation, but let's uh, just see what happens. And because I was talking to Attila this week, we have a different <laughs> standard set of matrices which are now called Gelman matrices rather than Pauli matrices. And you met the Gelman, I believe, in, the, in the Santa Fe, yeah. Anyway, um, you have, we now have nine coordinates uh, for these Hermitian matrices, and we have the same transformation, three by three, matrices, what do they what do they preserve as a transformation group? Well, they still preserve the determinant of the matrix, but yike, now the determinant is cubic in the coordinates, and who ordered that, or who wanted that? Well, nonetheless, you might be interested in such a case, so all I have to do is express the determinant as a cubic polynomial, and I have some kind of coefficient, set of coefficients there, which is in some sense a generalization of the previous case. So we're really interested in that, or we might be, not actually this particular setting, but in general, we kind of come across these things and we wonder about them. In fact, this is interesting because um, whereas before I could take plus or minus g in the two by two case and preserve the, <coughs> because the determinant of plus or minus g is plus or minus squared times the determinant of g, the thing would be preserved, but in this case, uh, I can modify the g by the cube root, cube root of one, and I still have the same transformation. So in, there's in fact, in fact, you can recognise this particular group, although as a nine by nine group, it's it's actually sort of slightly obscure from this point of view. It doesn't belong in any of the obvious classical presentations of, of matrix groups. So, so that's interesting. So we want to kind of follow along that that line and see what the group representation theory in, in this way can well, see whether we can sort out some, some difficulties for, that, that might come about with the representations. So, okay, so back to GLN, where do we normally start out with representations in, in GLN and then move to the easy cases and then move to maybe those more difficult cases. So that's, that's this famous subject of Scherbeil duality we have a finite dimensional space and fix the basis, so it's really a model space with 
<coughs> the structure of CM, and we consider tensor powers, or tensor factors, V tensor V, and, and so on. So in fact, in fact, V to the K, K, K tensor powers of, of V. How does the group act? How does GLN act? Just directly by um, commuting, by acting on the, on the vectors. Um, but at the same time, we have the symmetric group, which is able to uh, shuffle the components. So the product of K vectors can be rearranged by commuting the, the entries in that in that stream. So they'll be both actions of, of well, two different groups. And in fact, they, if you think about how to do one and then the other, and then the fact that they don't really talk to each other, those different uh, trans transformations, they commute. So the actions commute. And um, strictly speaking, for the appropriate theorem to work, you kind of tend to want to talk about the associated group algebras. Um, and uh, for the symmetric group, that's basically combinations of the group elements with, with uh, scalar complex numbers. And CGLN, uh, I just invented that that uh, symbol, um, it would be uh, finite linear combinations of complex scalars with uh, the whatever dimension matrices of GLN which are represented on this on this large V to the K dimensional space. Anyway, we can do it, we can do it like that, and then there's a big theorem, the double commutant theorem, says that in this case the the there's enough transformations to resolve the, the whole space into a complete decomposition of, into a direct sum of irreducible representations. And that's how we kind of work. We can uh, kind of infer things, facts about representations without going into it of GLN from the corresponding statements about the symmetric group, classic kind of thing. And uh, how do we go to these other cases, the, the other nice cases that I referred to in the first um, example? Well, the other classical groups which have series, uh, whole number labelled series, uh, aside from the exceptional Lie groups and all kinds of stuff, are the um, orthogonal and symplectic groups, and they're the ones where we've got some kind of metric or, and, or um, invariant bilinear form. <coughs> so um, symmetric in the orthogonal group case and anti-symmetric in the symplectic group case. And um, it's supposed to be non-singular, although, again, as far as matrix groups are concerned, um, perhaps, well, well, there's no real reason at the, at the level of this definition for it to be uh, non-singular, but the classical nice ones are only for the non-singular cases. And in that means in the, in the symplectic case that, that this N has to be actually even. So uh, group actions, well we have the permutation group, we have the, the classical matrix group commuting again, but in this case, in this case we can do something else, we can make some uh, other operations, so we can take one of these things called ERS, this is how it actually acts linearly in this, as a linear mapping in this case, to act on a string of vectors, I take the scalar product or the inner product with the R and S component out of these guys, but then I just put them back again, uh, relative to a fixed basis, but this is sort of basis independent. I just put these vectors back again <coughs> in the form of inserting in the right places the elements of the, of the basis and saturate with the elements of the invariant tensor. Now that's, that's a thing and also see because this is this is by definition invariant that uh, this commutes with the group action and so there's a whole uh, kind of these things generate uh, a whole set of transformations which build up to a commutant algebra the double commutant theorem applies and the, the matrix group and this bigger thing this Brouwer algebra in this case uh, are the ones which play the role of the GLN and the, and the SK. So the representation theory of these groups is, is related to this discrete uh, thing, this Brouwer algebra. Okay, so remember, my 
my favorite example was we did a three-way thing, not I can't point, can I? A three-way thing, not a two-way thing here. So what do we do about that? Summary. Uh, GLNs related to the symmetric group, orthogonal related to the Brouwer uh, thing. And in fact, we can sort of see it as a, as a chain of groups and subgroups and embeddings. GLN, orthogonal or symplectic, symmetric, the smaller than the Brouwer uh, algebra. And then actually, um, we can go further. In fact, we can think of just n by n permutation matrices and ask about the same questions in there, just n by n permutations seen as, as elements of, of, well, I guess they're probably orthogonal rather than symplectic, but anyway. Um, in fact, there is a dual algebra there, which is this very large uh, thing called the partition algebra, or bipartition algebra, which I guess um, has only relatively recently been sort of studied. This is the classical story, and this is just sort of coming in for the ride. So, can we, well, where does our favorite example of the three-way invariant fit in? Of course it doesn't. It's, these are the, this is just GLN, this is an invariant bilinear things, and well, this is something, something smaller, but the three-way thing is just kind of one of these pathological examples. So, um, what can we say, if anything, about it? Uh, there might be a lot of problems, and without going, going into it, uh, how would we characterize this algebra? Um, you might have noticed in one of the other transparencies, uh, I slipped in uh, an n, a parameter, in the Brouwer algebra. So there's some kind of extension, so one would need to study that. Well, maybe that's part of our, our project, I don't know. Um, and, of course, the three-way invariant uh, object is going to have a lot of different canonical forms, not quite as, as easy as the uh, kind of standard presentation of a symmetric um, two-way tensor or, or an anti-symmetric tensor, so, so that's going to be a potential difficulty. And of course, since these are sort of by definition not, not classical, uh, not in the classical list, then the representations will be generically pretty nasty, but I mean, for, for, for applications we'll be interested in. So this is where we uh, can sort of study the structure of, of, of the things on the dual side more independently. And these slides, because of my lack of time and preparation, I've just stolen them from the review by Halverson and Ram. Um, these, uh, as I say, the bipartition algebra or monoid is represented by transformation type uh, mappings. Uh, not the transformation semigroup itself, but things related to it, whereby I have a partition of, of uh, labels uh, which are repeated, the top and the bottom, and that top and bottom decomposition um, allows me to uh, have this scheme of multiplying diagrams by vertical stacking. And these are just uh, nice examples that, that uh, they use to, to do the multiplication of, say, this one, uh, this is a, these dots draw the uh, connections corresponding to one of these blocks in this set partition. Uh, and when you paste this one together with this one, of course, you just draw a line which kind of, which kind of encapsulates all of, the, all of the things in that block. And the vertical, the, the, the top one stays by itself and the bottom one stays by itself in, in either way. Uh, and what types of things are we interested in? Going back to our sort of classical uh, cases, the GLN, well, that was a symmetric group, which are of course just permutations, which have got a, uh, which have got the same number of, of uh, transversal components as the as the nodes. Uh, for the Brouwer one, apart from the symmetric group, we've got these extra uh, things which represent that operation of E, ERS, the little bipartite uh, thingies which could take the two vectors. Basically they're taking the two vectors and, and spewing something back out again to, to give you a, an action on that space. And uh, there are variations of, of, of degree of definition in these things and one that, that uh, is often studied is the planar version of this with no crossings which is the, uh, the Jones Um, there's a 
hierarchy, no, I'm not going to go into it. There's a hierarchy of definitions, but it's, a, it's reasonable to sort of ask. There's a hierarchy of definitions whereby, uh, you know, in the hardcore, as far as I understand it, the hardcore semi monoid thing, um, one starts with the, the, the monoid, uh, but one can still extend or twist the monoid by having what I would call it a parameter, but if you're if you're fancy about it, it's still a monoid because there's this ag abstract extra element. And then I believe when you would define the algebra, this element becomes it becomes over some ring or something, or the element becomes lambda times the identity or something like that. So probably the temple in V you would call at that point you would call it the algebra, which came from the Jones. Temporary, if the te temporary lead monoid probably is the one which is the extension, but without yet being an algebra. Des and Des and Nick are very fancy about this, and James would probably probably jump up and down about that. But yeah, I'm, he's, he's I'm, not at the moment. He's, 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 oh, he's just jumped. Oh, okay. Oh, hi, James. <laughs> yeah. So that that might make a not, that might be complete nonsense, but but uh, that my rough interpretation of the of the different sort of sensitivities to to what these things are called. It's, it's not nonsense. Oh, good, thank you. Might be wrong, but it's not nonsense. <laughs> okay, so let's let's have a look at this at this three-way thing, um, just to just to kind of really just state what it's like, how its multiplications are, and basically this is what Nick and, and Des have been doing, so I'm just reporting uh, their results. Um, and uh, this kind of project in a sense was suggested by my collaborator um, Valkyrie Fowler in, uh, in the works in the UK uh, because of other stuff that I hope I'll, I'll, I'll indicate. So um, now with the, with the Jones or this extension, the Temperley lead case, one would have the generators, these ERS, you don't need the all the R and S, you, don't, you only need R and R plus one, so you would have like k minus one of those because you need the loops to go up to the up to the top transpositions, uh, not transpositions, but, but these loop generators. Now we're for these triaps. Triapsid means three. Well, Des suggests this triapsid means three uh, three prongs, um, top or bottom. Uh, so we're going to have three of the. Well, we're going to have up to k minus two of these things. So I could only manage to draw small examples. Uh, and only a few drawings, uh, so G1, G2, G3 uh, would be the generators for the F5. And uh, Nick has been busy with really generating the whole lot of, of, of diagrams or elements of the semi-group, really, or monoid, um, uh, by brute force and, and checking that, that, that uh, you've got the complete set and, and counting. I'll, I'll show you the list in a minute. Um, and uh, well, it's not so simple as you might sort of guess, suspect. It's not so simple as the as the Brower or Jones case, where you stick with the uh, with the loops at the top and bottom. You can now have more complicated things joining together and getting transversals, which have a more complex structure in the top uh, top section and the bottom section of, of the block. Um, and and of course run into that right in the very first examples. So can you say anything about that? Well, as I say, just reporting on, on their um, investigations. Um, these are typical things that, that, that are certainly there in, in the F5 case. Um, well, uh, this may be not so bad because what happens in the, with this extension idea, what happens in the um, well, what happens in the Jones case is that you just ignore this this loop and just cancel it and call that call that just a single transversal from from this point to this point. Um, in the Brouwer case, this is this, bus this business of the extra parameter. One would have a parameter for that, and as I indicated with my earlier thing, this parameter actually turns into the basically it's the dimension, it's the trace of the product of the metric, the, the, the bilinear invariant with its inverse in, in, the, in the actual representation context case. But now we've got this one and we've also got this little guy 
so I call that the loop, and this one is the fork. And we've got a lot more uh, which arise in, in higher um, uh, pay. And what Nick uh, proved is that these transversal blocks, these types of things which come in, are going to have, of course, a certain number of elements in the top, a certain number of elements in the bottom, but the relationship is T equals S mod 3. So it's a kind of generalisation of the Brouwer case where T equals S mod 2, I guess, so you can either have the loops or just a, well, just a single, single one, um, basically, and, and, and only guess only, uh, only those cases. In this case we're going to have a lot more. We have 3 with 0, 3 with 3, 2 with 2, 5 with 2, 2 with 5 and so on. And we conjecture, or and, and Nick has checked this up to this about 11, that if you define a different thing, which is the, the planar case of the general bipartition guy, where you just take all the diagrams which have this structure for the transversal elements, and say, well, that's a thing, and it's going to be closed, and so on. It's a, established that in its own right as a submonoid, and then we conjecture that this curly T thing is, is identical to our, our F thing, which is defined by these uh, generators, these G1 to GK minus 1. Um, so, yeah, so, so what else has, have they done? Um, looked at ideals, the left, the, the, the way the blocks behave under multiplication, and these kind of answers I think are sort of subcases of what's known for the, for the general bipartition case, and what you have to do, as you can imagine, when you do the, the up-down stacking, you have to look at the structure of the upper and, and lower kind of blocks and, and, and sort of classify things according to what happened there. And so without going into it, they've done these famous uh, semi-group um, uh, purposes, these famous equivalence relations called the Green's relations and they're determined by a slightly finer grain structure of looking at the upper and lower parts. Um, orderings and, and, and the numbers that are in these, that are in these parts. Uh, something of interest in relation to uh, broader questions are obviously I suppose it's always a question of presentation and clearly with the uh, Jones one, uh, or simply Lieb one, we've got these exchange relations, these constraints, these famous uh, things, uh, and that happens when the, the loops and so on only, only uh, overlap one another by one uh, shift up and down. Uh, but uh, we've, got, we've got that, but now we've also got the differences of, of generators by up to two. And so you can have a string of four things with differences going up and down up to two, or you might have more. It's not at all clear how to organize this systematically into relations. Maybe the set of relations that you need uh, never kind of stabilizes. It's, it's just not known. Although you might think you can infer something from the, from the general bipartition case, I don't know. People might have ideas about it. Uh, but what we need is diagrams, um, and uh, well, no, sorry. Um, so what, what, what I wanted to well, give you, I've given you enough diagrams. I couldn't, I didn't have enough energy to draw any more of these things explicitly. But it's interesting to to sort of think about how how things might work. Okay, so what I wanted to do for the for the next part, am I am I going too fast, too slow, or what? Uh, probably not too bad. So I wanted to spend ten minutes on a on a more tenser excursion of of this, and and again. This gets back to a sort of a more linear, comp uh, uh, linear algebra kind of interpretation of what's going on, and the motivation for it is, um, well, just what I said before. In, in, in physics, we kind of have a have a more more um, inclination to do things in in, in a, a linear algebra framework with tensors, tensor algebra, tensor analysis, and so. Um, as, as you've already seen from my examples, at one level this just means writing down a whole lot of stuff in, in tensor notation and, and working stuff out carefully. Um, but uh, to sort of give, give a sort of touch of a good imprimatur to that, uh, you can take recourse to a, a higher level uh, language and the, the appropriate 
kind of context for it seems, seems to be these so-called monoid categories or portents categories, of which there's, of course, a huge, um, uh, huge and overwhelming uh, kind of parentage. Um, but for our purposes, what I want to illustrate, it's just really, as I say, it just gives you an excuse, excuse to write down more diagrams and maybe a bit different from the, from the ones talked about already and have a justification for how you want to manipulate stuff. So, so just to, to do that, the, the, it's, going to be, it's going to be graphs or diagrams with, with things happening, but now, now not just transformation indi to indicate transformations, but they will really be indicating maps. And this, the sort of basic thing is that, you know how, how in maths you normally indicate maps with you know, domain range, F goes from B to W. What you do is the dual of that. You put the, you put the source uh, element in the domain and uh, that actually becomes an arrow, whereas the mapping becomes the node. So it's the reverse. Here are the nodes and here's the arrow. Here essentially are the arrows and here is the node. So you do it like that. And you do it to get the analogy with the previous diagram sort of algebra thing. You do it vertically. The only tricky thing is that tensor products are represented just by putting the diagrams side by side. Composition is still up and down, but tensor products are side by side. And with directed uh, edges, you can also indicate, this, if you need to, the space and its dual space, and just algebraic dual linear maps. So here's, here's this interpretation just of the, just of the background space or the model space CM, uh, just choosing a, a basis and a, and a dual basis. Of course, the dual space will be the same as the, uh, dual space will be the same or isomorphic to the original space, but it's still useful to, to have this distinction for the purposes of, of constructing stuff. So the basic ingredients you need are these, are these uh, uh, well, reading from top to bottom, this, this is nothing. And, and basically that's a map which takes a, a scalar, a unit, into tensor product of two spaces. So um, well, if I multiply it by any fixed scalar, it's just proportional. So I just need to say what the unit element one maps to, which is this vector in V star cross V. V star because it's, this line is going up and V because this line is going down. And that's basis independent, or I have to indicate it using or the other way around, or, uh, oh, okay, so those, those are the caps, and the cups are, if I take a vector, uh, which is a line heading down, and a dual vector, which is a line heading up, and I want to make nothing out of it, or want to make a scalar out of it, I just act with that dual element on that vector, and I get delta, same way, that way. And of course, I've, of course I've got these uh, permutations, or just switches, so this is a very simple setting for something that's, that can be a lot more complicated. But for example, it, 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 it justifies why you can do certain things. So this, this being equivalent to this is just the expression that if I, if I compose these things <coughs> like this is, just, this is just this evaluation and this one here is one of these uh, putting it all back together again. And if I do that, it's just, it's just a, uh, the identity map. The identity map means do nothing, so there's no label uh, to indicate a, any other sort of specific mapping. Um, <coughs> whereas, if, whereas if I've got this uh, bilinear form, well, that's really a that's really a cup with two lines going in, as opposed to these ones where there's a line going in and a line going out. So you can transcribe all the actual notation you want into this diagrammatic scheme. Mm. Different, slightly different types of diagrams. Uh, also, it's clear that if you've got this, this bilinear form, you've also got a, a natural kind of relationship between the space V, which is the line going down, and the space V star, which is the line going up. So you've got both of these things automatically. And inverses, well, this just, this just shows you that the bilinear form and its inverse are matrix inverses because they just cancel and you get, you get those left and right inverses. So, uh, and basically you don't need to worry about, about directed lines because you've got this relationship. 
So how would we do that for the triapsid one? Well, we'll take a self-contragredient uh, case because that lets us basically say that there's this invariant trilinear form. I map three vectors into something. Uh, and I'm also going to have these isomorphisms. I have to be given this. So this is actually a slightly special case. Uh, but then once you do this, then you can sort of see in this language where the fork comes from because you can start to bend lines around. So, so this is this original one here, but if I use this cut cup here, that's bent around, uh, but then I can use the theta or the appropriate theta to make that line pull down as well. See, so I've got that one. And I can also, once I, if I bend one, I may as well bend two, and so those positions correspond to those there. That one's coming down, so everything's all right. Or I can finally make the upside down, uh, whatever that thing is called, triapsis cap, uh, which is pulling them all down. Or, uh, from, the, from the previous one, once I've got that one, I can say, well, what happens if I take one of these and pull it up? Well, that's actually the same, the same operation. I'm sort of just doing things, doing things twice and reversing, reversing some operations. So now you see, uh, without, without putting the arrows in, because it's a nuisance to draw them all, you can see sort of where the origin of the fork, which I had before, and the loop. So, so now, I mean, this is, this is equal. We tend to draw these things in doing manipulations with the diagram monoid picture, we tend to draw these things just as the connectivity of, of how these things arise with the transversal thing. So this is, this is really a true statement in the, the language of these more, this background language of these diagram manipulations. This is justified by the right whatever category things. And, and there's the loop, uh, that, that thing. So these are, these are justified by these rigorous moves of yanking and pulling things around and teasing them out and so on. And it's easy to check with the, the, the algebraic kind of equivalence. Okay, so there's a nice lemma uh, here that in, these, in this framework, <coughs> up to some uh, kernel, this thing on V tends to V and this thing on V uh, basically have the same spectrum. Because if you, if, well, roughly speaking, if, if, if either of these has a, a polynomial kind of characteristic identity whose roots would indicate its spectrum, then you would just say, say, you, had, say you had an identity for this guy. Well, basically, that's, that's a number of combination of loops on top of one another. <coughs> what you could do then would be to cut the top bit off, off each such power and the bottom bit and lo and behold you actually have one of these. If you put these together and cut off the top and bottom you just got these. So they're <coughs> close relationship between those two things which might or might not help in the, in the actual interpretation. Uh, and this is a, this could, would, could be something which happens uh, in a, a special case. You might, might assume um, might be interesting to, to take cases where uh, these special conditions are applying. So, I mean, this, this, for, this, uh, this top here is basically a some kind of product, isn't it? I'm, I'm taking two things and I'm making a third thing. So it's a product, which I could say, well, does it have some nice properties? Like, is it associative to two together and then the third one is equal to one and then those two, is it associative? And then uh, how does it go with uh, splitting? And this particular axiom is the so-called Frobenius um, axiom, that the, the product and then branching is the same as, well, those two things, doing it in, in those orders. And then that, in that case, there is a standard uh, sort of normal form uh, lemma where all of, all of these complicated ways in which the connectivity can arise, which I was <coughs> mentioning before, <coughs> in this framework, all of them can be reduced to a standard form, which is quite interesting. <coughs> if the, <coughs> uh, you have to allow for de decorations by loops, but basically they can all be reduced to some kind of star-like generalization of this, where you just got a whole bunch of them at the top and a whole bunch of them at the bottom. Obviously there's a, a, a connection, which is 
like the center of the star, with some decoration of, of loops. So that's kind of could be of, could be of interest in, in sorting out exactly what what's possible in the in the algebraic structure. Okay, so we're nearly finished. So just some just some uh, final remarks about further motivation and why we might be interested in pursuing these things. This is one of my one of my best production efforts on the. <laughs> On the diagrams, and this one was stolen just to, just to show you kind of what what might be interested in terms of of of, of, of this. So this is one of these famous um, square, so-called square ice uh, situations that people are very interested in in, in the statistical uh, world, the configurations of this thing, these particular vertices, and so on. If you take the right slices here, you can see that this is a this is nothing but a kind of concatenation of a lot of elements of the um, Jones monoid or temporary leave algebra, depending on what you're uh, what you're working with. And the, so the, the the secret is that the structure of those things, representations of those things, are, are extremely critical in in evaluating all of the statistical aspects, thermodynamic aspects of of such toy models of two-dimensional systems in physics and their critical behavior, their phase transitions and whatever. Toy models, spherical power models, but nonetheless interesting. So, so a long-term kind of aspiration, if you take that bizarre looking object uh, made up from the triapsid monoid, um, I don't know if you can coordinatize it into any kind of lattice thing, but it would be nice to weight configurations of this and uh, have some Maybe it's a maybe it's a thing looking for an application, but it's, it's it's interesting as well. It's actually psychedelic. If you try tracing that and working out where the connectivities, uh, I'll guarantee. <coughs> well, it might be a good thing to do on the on the ride home to uh, Henrith or, <laughs> or wherever. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, and and actually, I mean, these things are also models of of uh, like polymers, self-avoiding warps, fully packed polymer loops and so on and, and, and their configurations. <coughs> um, what would this be? Well, it seems to us, just on a rough basis, that in this thing it's like a self-avoiding warp, but there's a sort of probability along each length that the thing could branch and, and, and also join up as well. So it's a self-avoiding warp which allows some branching. I don't know. I mean, it's just a wild, just a wild kind of throwaway remark, but it's in the pretty picture anyway. Enumeration. I mean, there are, there are untold untold uh, ramifications of of, of um, the loop algebras in, in, in combinatorics, other other kind of connections with paths, trees, and and so on. We know them all. Uh, with the Catalan numbers being the growth of the of the um, I guess it's the cardinality of the of the diagrams. Now mix. Uh, Triumph was to kind of grind this out for our uh, for our new guys, and <laughs> this is the series totally unknown to uh, Super Seeker. Um, uh, I'm kind of tempted to call this the sort of if these are the Catalan numbers, which are for the biforks, well, these ought to be the what the tricatamaran numbers or something like that. <laughs> it's a poor joke, I know, but. Uh, anyway, there's lots of them. I did this example by hand. <laughs> uh, well, it's 19 if you include the identity. So, <laughs> and uh, well, just to just to sort of round the story out, why why we might also be interested in this stuff is not just for that particular reason of the of the three by three uh, invariant, but but we've been quite as I probably discussed last year, we've been quite interested in in the kind of formal character theory using symmetric function methods for these classical groups and the, uh, yeah, the, the so-called universal characters sort of independent of a particular group dimension but just the, the structure of the character rings and so forth. Well, well, it turns out that actually in a formal way one can actually generalize quite a lot of relationships that might have been relevant to the to these cases, one can one can formally write down quite a lot of things which 
ought to be true for these more general cases, and what they're actually true of is not actually too certain. They might be group characters, but in some cases the groups might not actually exist, or they might be there might be nothing which solves some cubic identity. You know, the group might be the identity matrix, it might be trivial. But in general, there are a lot of there is a lot of stuff which is universal about these whole different cases. And this is only the this is only the rank three or the three by three case. We've got we've got all of these sort of generalizations for a lot of arbitrary cases. So from that point of view, there's something interesting to look at. We're we're trying to work back on, on the other side to, to, to see what what can be said. And uh, I think that's the end of the story, folks. Sorry it was a bit long. Example which you probably missed, you may have missed. I can't remember when, when you turned yeah. up. But my first example was supposed to be a supposed to be a simple instance of such a group, a matrix group. Uh, in in this case, it just sort of falls off falls off the off the wall because you take a determinant of a three by three matrix and you have some invariance and you realise that it's got to be cubic. I mean, one is one is worried in studying these things that these groups might not be there at all. In fact, in some cases, they are, they are just discrete groups, and you might you, you might think, well, you know all that you need to know basically already about discrete groups. So, so this is sort of not so not so interesting. But but here's a case where the thing actually <laughs> exists as a as a matrix group, and and actually in this case it's even it's even more because in in fact. You can show that the Lie algebras are isomorphic. There are 18-dimensional Lie algebras involved, and, and, and so there's really a kind of local. So, so this group here, as a nine by nine group of matrices, is actually this group in disguise. And so what we would say for, oh, there's characters, there's certain things, blah, blah, blah. We use different techniques, but actually they must, must all be corresponding in correspondence with representations of this guy. So this is a sort of a, it's sort of experimental mathematics, I suppose. We want to see see funny stuff in for this one in a different language. And you know, you have these things like this three to one association between the group uh, elements and so on. Do you have a second question, James? Um, yeah. So I sort of mentioned this to to Nick or maybe Des last time. Um, and I was just curious if. Um, so you've got these triapses with, um, you know, joining three consecutive points. Yeah, those ones, yeah. Um, so, you, so you could think of this as a planar version of a bigger triapsis thing where you're about to join any three points whatsoever. Is, has, is there any, uh, any progress on that sort of line of thinking? Uh, is, is, that, is, that this, is that this thing, that question you're asking about? Um, or is it different? I'm not quite sure I understand what so, the, okay. what so, the general so thing get, is. So take the definition of TK there and just get rid of the word planar. Um, so, you know, you could have, instead of, so your, your G1 connects points 1, 2, and 3 together. Yep. Maybe you're, you're allowed to have uh, connect points 1, 7, and 57, 57 or something like that. Because uh, the Brouwer, the Brouwer semi-group is sometimes easier to, You mean as in this thing? Yeah. Yeah. So B yeah. seven yeah. typically yeah. is is much simpler to to think about than J seven. So maybe a a version of the triapsid semi group where you don't insist on planarity would somehow be a bit bit easier. Well, yeah. I'm glad you said that because because I'm forever sort of suggesting that they 
they should do that as well, because that's of course, or the equivalent is, is the one that naturally comes out of the, of the dealing with the group representations. Yeah, you want the full, you want the full Monty, definitely. So, but Des just says, oh, there's a whole morphism, or there is there is a restriction between that one and the planar one, so we should study the simpler one first. He says the planar one is simpler. <laughs> so, um, with your with your remark in mind, I shall go and challenge them again about that. <laughs> I mean, in some cases it's simpler, but in some cases it's, it's definitely the other way around. Okay. Oh, good point. What about um, what about quadrapses or pentapses or n-apses? Well, you know, my my favourite example: take four by four matrices, take five by five matrices. I don't know. I suspect that 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 at some point it just devolves to the full partition thing. I would suspect, and and I'm hoping or thinking that this is not quite there yet because of your mod three kind of thing. So you, it could be, yeah, I don't know, don't know. I have one more question, which is um, about your surfboard design. Surfboard design, oh, good one, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. some pre-coded nodes or something and oh, I just couldn't do it so I, I, what I did there was a there was a, a word find puzzle in the paper that day with a convenient 14 by 14 block of words and I just drew some things in order to give myself the, the definition of the of the generators to, <laughs> to do it and I tweaked it until I until I got some interesting connections and it looked nice Thank you.